You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Boy, oh boy, it's been a fun one. Um, This is the first, I guess, actual Packernet Podcast since the trade has gone down. And so the, I guess the only other thing that we need to accomplish today, because there really is no further context. no additional details, nothing. I want to go over what Brian Gutekunst said. And then we have to spend a little bit of time going over some of the things that some of the other people have said. We should probably start with Brian Gutekunst because I have a feeling I'm going to get a little worked up when we start talking about guys like Rich Eisen and uh, some of the other comments that are brought up about this trade and the nonsense that is being spewed out. But uh, yeah, let's start off with the Brian Gutekunst press conference. Um couple different questions asked a lot of questions about the trade process he does talk about it a little bit but then kind of after a while it's like look guys we're not talking about this we'll do it later once this thing is finalized because it is not officially final which is an important note because it's one of those things that as i listen to it i can just picture because this has happened a thousand times the trade goes through officially and there's key details that were left out and everybody freaks out and then you get the contingent of people saying you bunch of idiots you're running your mouth about who won and you don't even know and yeah so it's like all right fine it's not finalized we don't actually know yet it's possible that there are details that yet have not been worked out and 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 the thing is Gutekunst is very clear on that in terms of borderline trying to scare you that this may change but i really just think it's it's a process thing in terms of i can't talk about this until it's officially done Probably for the for the protection of getting it done, right? You don't want to flap your gums and then something bad happens. It breaks the deal. Like, it's in place. Shut your mouth. Let the paperwork get done and processed, and then we can talk about it because then there's no going. No takesies, backsies, son. I can talk all the trash I want. Um, talks about the importance of it done prior to the draft. Draft preparation versus trade process. Um, taking a quarterback in the draft, et cetera, et cetera. Again, this was said multiple times, but I think this is probably the best summary. Um, that the question is: Is it mostly just paperwork at this point? Is it paperwork at this time. At this point, uh, mostly, yeah. Um, but like, those are significant, so we're, we're not there yet. But again, um, we're, we're we're expected to have this done before the draft. So that that is about the best summary you're going to get. Everything else is just kind of reiterating. But um, it's it's mostly paperwork, but that's significant, and they're expecting it to be done prior to the draft. So. Um, but again, even still, I mean, we need somebody, once the paperwork gets submitted, to actually see the detail. There's also the, the question of the, um, the contract, which has been coming up. My, my thought on this is that some comments have been made about the contract that are um, a little bit flippant, and that everything is going to be exactly as we expected it to be. There have been some comments about um, things that are going to happen to help the Packers' salary cap, but I, I think that is essentially what we always knew it was going to be, slash a slight misunderstanding by, I think it was Tom Pellicero. Um, Ian also made a comment about, uh, said that the, the Jets would be taking on the, the $58 million or whatever, which, I mean, obviously. And so there, there really just isn't much room there in terms of here's the money that we already owe, and then here's the rest of the money that the Jets are going to pay. What else is there? There might be something, but I, I, 
I, uh, my understanding of the salary cap is limited at that point. The, the only question would be what could there possibly be that would make it so that the Packers don't have to put money that's already in Aaron Rodgers' pocket on the salary cap? And the only thing I can think of would be Aaron Rodgers cuts the Packers a check. <laughs> or the, the Jets cut him a check, which I don't think could even happen. I don't think that's a thing. But um, my expectation is that won't change either. So I think everything's going to be as it is. But again, to reiterate, it's not done until it's done. So we'll just take it at face value for now and we'll see what happens. Uh, next question, how important is it to get it done before the draft? It's very important for us, I think, you know. Uh, wouldn't have been the end of the world, but at the same time, I think uh, it would have certainly changed things quite a bit. So getting it done ahead of time was important. So, well, well I guess I'll let him finish. Why? I just think certainly the capital for this year, you know, um, was very important. Certainly more valuable than than future stuff. So uh, for our football team, um, so there was just there was a number of reasons, but that's why. So, kind of obvious answer to the question because we wanted picks for this year. Um, he did put in the caveat that it's important. And he said, for our franchise, now, again, we're just completely reading between the lines here, but it, it sounds like he's distinguishing between um, something that is an absolute rule as opposed to something that's important in our particular situation, which the obvious thing, well, it, 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 it's at least one of two things. Number one, obviously Jordan Love. But then the other is we just need pieces this year more so than in, in past years. We, we can't really, I uh, wouldn't say can't, but we, we would prefer to get as many pieces as we can and, and look at how many people left so yeah we we could certainly use that um question how important is it to get a quarterback i'd, I'd like to say it's really no you know different i mean it's always important to us that position is something that we spend as much time on, on as any uh, every single year because we just understand how important that position is to the to a football team so um this year is very important um, but really no more important than it has been in the past so here's another one of those situations where the GM is telling us something and nobody's going to choose to believe it, right? When when they picked Jordan Love because they genuinely thought he was the best at the position and really thought he could be the quarterback of the future, um, a lot of people chose not to believe that that was the reality, and instead it was a slap in the face to Aaron Rodgers just because he wants to be a petty jerk or because they're trying to push Rodgers out. It's not because they actually believe in Jordan Love. It's it's because, you know, whatever. Um, it's going to be the same thing here if we draft a quarterback. Now, a first-round quarterback is one thing, but um, at any other position, if we pick somebody, like if we took a corner, it wouldn't be an indictment of Jair. It wouldn't really be any of that. Even first-round corner. So th the reality is, Look, they're, they're, they're going to go through the process and they're going to pick what they believe is the best possible pick for the team. And there's a very good chance that quarterback ends up being one of them. And that doesn't have anything to do with Jordan Love. Um, kind of an obvious answer, but there was a question asked, is it fair to say you're rebuilding? No, I don't, I don't ever look at it like that. You know, we're excited about this football team and where it can go. Obviously, we're a long ways away from what our 53-man roster and our 16-man practice squad is going to look like. Um, but we're really excited about it. It's going to be new, obviously, specifically a quarterback, uh, it looks like. But um, at the same time, we're, you know, the goals don't change around here. It's going to be the same goals we've always had, right? There's, there's one goal here every single year, no matter what. And um, just like it was back in the last time we kind of we, we moved on from one quarterback to the other, right? The goals are the same. Um, and, and it's going to be on those guys to put in the work, and, and it's going to be exciting to see. But, um, yeah, nothing's really changing. See, and first of all, that it's an obvious answer. But it's the right answer, right? It's, it's what fans want to hear. It's what the GM should be saying. But also, similar to what we had talked about before, as far as, I think, um, Jersey Mike? Somebody called into Packernet After Dark. And anyways, the point is setting a precedent. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing. Can you back it up? When he says the goal is the same as it is every year, that means one thing for the Packers. It means another thing for the Jets or for the Bears or for the Lions or even for the Vikings, for that matter. We have a goal and we intend to achieve it. We are going to put together a good football team. We are going to win football games. We are going to win the division. And it's not only do we do this every year, we did this the last time we switched quarterbacks. But there, there's another component here that I find obnoxious. One of the things that I've mentioned several times that annoys me to no end is the fact that Jordan Love is the only first-round quarterback that you're not allowed to expect to be any good at anything, which I think is insane. But also, where is this idea coming from that... It's ridiculous to think you're not rebuilding. What what are we rebuilding? 
Are we rebuilding our offensive line? No. Are we re- rebuilding our running back room? No. Are we rebuilding a quarterback? No. We have our quarterback. Are we rebuilding at wide receiver? No. We might need to add a guy, but we're not rebuilding. What are we rebuilding on defense? Are we rebuilding our, our corners? No, we have that. You're rebuilding your edge rushers? No. We might add a guy, but no. Defensive tackles? No. Again, maybe add a guy, but we're good there. Linebackers? No. What are we rebuilding? What is it we need to tear down? Who are the old guys we got to get rid of and then start completely starting from the ground up and build through the trenches? We need a new offensive line, defensive line. We need pass rushers and corners. And wh- wh- Where is this? I don't know where it is. Every team needs some more and could certainly add some more. But in what way are we rebuilding now that we weren't rebuilding over the last 30 years of my life? How is this any different than 2020? Well, Rodgers is better. What does that have anything to do with rebuilding? What are we rebuilding? People weren't pissing and moaning back then about holes. Of course we had holes then. We had deficiencies there. That doesn't mean you're rebuilding. We have every we, we have the core guys at every position, and they're all really young guys. There is no rebuilding. There's a question of do we need more talent? Maybe, probably. We have to see if Jordan Love can be the guy, but, but here, here's the ultimate test. If Jordan Love is the guy, do we have a, a, a playoff caliber team? The answer is yes. How do I know? Because it's the same freaking team that Aaron Rodgers took to the playoffs, with the exception of Devontae, right? I mean, there's no, I mean, every year has some changes. There are no majorly significant changes. So, I mean, you're, you're going to have to tell me what your definition of rebuild even means if you think the Packers are rebuilding. What do we need to rebuild? What is one thing? In my opinion, rebuilding is we have a team, but most of this team, this is not our core, right? Look at the Chicago Bears. They technically have an offensive line, but this is not the offensive line anybody envisions for the future, and they basically need an entirely new offensive line. That's the same for their defensive line. That's the same for their corners. That's the same for their, for for the most part, their wide receivers. I mean, even some of the older veterans that they brought in, these are not long-term fixes. These are short-term gaps but like who who are their core players justin fields okay maybe i don't think so but let's just pretend okay who else who's a core player on their team who give, give me a name i would have said montgomery they just got rid of the freaking guy they went out and got a wide receiver that hasn't played a single snap you're gonna tell me that's a core player for their team so i i don't understand maybe it's the word rebuild maybe a better way to put it is do you think maybe you're a year away do you think maybe like you, you need to take, it's going to take two years of adding pieces before you can compete? Maybe that's a better way to put it. In that case, the, the question is maybe, and again, it all just comes down to Jordan Love, but rebuild, I, I, I feel like either people just don't know what the word means, or they have a really weird definition of it, or they just use it completely inpro- inappropriately. It's like, <laughs> it's like if you're making a cake, and it's pretty much done, like, you, I mean, you you got all the wet ingredients, the dry ingredients, you mix it all up, you baked it, you took it out, it's already cool, you made your frosting fresh, and now you just have to apply the frosting. It's like the final step, like we got a couple, you know, we, we got to put the, we got to frost it, and then we got to like put sprinkles on it and put some candles in it and then light it, and then we got a birthday cake. And it's like, oh, are you going to rebake that? What? Are you going to like make a new cake? You're going to rebake it? No, I mean, it's almost done. We're, we're going to add a couple pieces and then, then we're going to eat it. No, oh, but it might not taste good. It might not, but this is what I made, and we're almost done making it. So I'm going to frost it, and we're going to eat it. That's the whole thing. I'm not rebaking a cake. Next, I think critical question that I think makes a lot of sense because everybody asked that and asked this, and I kind of give a a similar answer. But the the question being asked is uh, did, essentially, do you feel like you need to load up around Jordan? Chance to succeed. Yeah. Well, I think we've got to remember that we're we're trying to win games, and that takes all three phases. So we're going to load up as much as we can in all three phases. Um, you know, certainly um, as, as we go forward, I mean, the offensive skill um, will be part of that, just like everything else. But um, um, I'm not really looking at it kind of in that that window. I'm kind of looking at it the whole team. So I mean, it, it it seems relatively obvious. I mean, I think the question from a lot of fans largely is. Are we completely doomed? Is Jordan Love doomed if we don't add to him? Which, again, comes from this sort of mentality that this team is just complete garbage, which, again, is weird to me. Like, we, we talk about this all the time. Teams that are drafted in the top 10, they get their quarterback. They don't have an offensive line, wide receivers, nothing. Jordan Love has an offensive line. He has wide receivers, and he has running backs. He, he maybe would be beneficial if we got him another 
wide receiver, no question. Two wide receivers, I don't really, not, I don't want to say I don't see the point, but there's certainly a diminishing return. Uh, tight end, I mean, yeah, it'd be great to get a tight end, but we're not going to be too much worse off than we have been since the last forever. So the idea that like, well, he's completely doomed if we don't do something is, is nonsense. But the, the larger question of, is the best thing for the team to find a way to support Jordan Love? No, the best thing for the team is to do what's best for the team. And the best thing to do for the team is to find ways to make the team better. And the best way to do that is to get the best possible players, especially at premium positions, especially, especially at premium positions, ideally at positions of need. Now, there's different levels to that and and different levels of importance, but way, 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 way down there is just picking specific things because, right? I mean, we need safety help. We need edge rusher help. We need defensive tackle help. We might need corner help to completely walk away from that with a preconceived notion that we have to do something for Jordan Love, I just don't think is the right way to go about doing things. On top of that, as I said yesterday, I'm pretty sure Gutekunst is massively in love with primarily the defensive pieces. I'm largely confident this will be a defensive pick. Just just having gone through, I mean, if you haven't listened to it, go listen to the podcast I did yesterday. But you look at the amount of edge rushers and corners and defensive tackles, really just one, but you take those guys that fit all the thresholds, that make all the, I mean, again, premium position, high RAS, big, strong, physical, fast, it's corners and edge rushers, and then Brian Brzee. How many wide receivers fit those thresholds? Basically zero. How many tight ends fit those thresholds? Darnell, plus it's a tight end. Maybe Kincaid, I don't know what his RAS would be. I don't, I'm not sure. He didn't do workouts based on two different injuries. He had a thoracic injury that kept him out of the combine and a back injury that kept him out of his pro day. Are we taking a guard? No. Center? No. Running back? Probably not. Quarterback? Probably not. So what's left? Tackle. There's a couple of them, but the bottom line is the the odds that we take a defensive piece, in my mind, are way above the odds that we end up taking an offensive piece. So I I just bring that up because I I wonder if that's in the back of Brian Gutekunst's mind as he hears this and he wants to immediately put that to bed and dispel that and call that immediately uh, stupid so that when he inevitably takes that defensive piece, you know, there, there will hopefully be some sort of a seed planted there. Just, just, just thinking maybe that's part of it. Uh, he addressed safety. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Basically just said, yes, it's an area that we're hoping to add to. We'll see. We still have the draft and we have free agency and all that stuff to, to, to work through that. Also, and, and again, I, I don't know if we'd necessarily call these shots, but I, I mentioned, I think, yesterday that he's much more comfortable making comments about Rodgers that I don't think he would have said. I skipped one already earlier, but this would be kind of a, a little half a shot. Uh, earlier, he just kind of addressed how he, he, he brought up again talking about the process of, of moving on and why they decided to. He said, you know, we, we try to get a bunch of impact, uh, uh, input, wanted to get it from Rodgers, but he wouldn't uh, talk to me. So that was disappointing, he said to be able to get his input on the situation, to be able to decide what to do moving forward. But then the next question is, you know, this is your first time drafting without having Aaron Rodgers on the team. You know, is, is this going to be a little bit different for you? Yeah, we had some of those off-seasons. I wasn't sure, you know, so I mean, you know, I mean, to be honest with you. So again, j- just if nothing else, even if you don't want to call it a shot, because I don't know that it was necessarily a shot, it's just the openness. And I'm just excited to be able to hear more honesty, largely because, again, it drove me insane last year. The fact that nobody seemed to want to speak honestly about Aaron Rodgers, Gutekunst or Matt LaFleur, and it made me nuts. And we've got some much better examples coming up, but to just be able to hear, like, honestly, what the heck was going on, and just to be able to hear him say, look, it is kind of some BS, but, you know, it is what it is. It's refreshing. And again, uh, just not something I haven't said a bunch of times, but um, since the GM said it, I may as well play it so that... um, You know, people don't listen to me and think, what the heck do you know? But the question is about, are you a need guy or a best player available guy? Uh, Yeah, I think you'd love to say every single pick is just best player available um, because you truly don't know what your needs are going to be when you come um, to the season. Um, at the same time, it's it's hard not to let those subconsciously or consciously kind of enter your mind what your roster looks at right at the moment as you're looking at these players, how you stack your board. I've always kind of felt as we stack our board through the last four months that um, – because we really do um, evaluate for our football team, not the league, that subconsciously, if we have a need, it's going to factor in um, how we stack that board. So, um, 
again, I think if we can, best practice is best player available just because I think by the time we get to September, October, November, what our needs are could be anything. So, again, what, what, what has been my official stance on how this stuff works? Every team is both best player available and a needs-based drafter. It's just a sliding scale, and the question is to what degree do you slide one way or another? And the Packers have historically been a team that is more on the best player available side of things than other teams. But everybody has some um, mix on that spectrum. And then I guess, you know, just sort of the bigger question becomes, okay, so, and this is kind of what some of the questions have been alluding to in terms of, you know, things are different now, things are have changed, you got Jordan Love, like, are you trying to support him more, are you thinking more offense more? It's just really a question about, are you maybe going to slide a little bit more need, are, are some of those subconscious thoughts going to be poking out of the back of your head a little bit more maybe this year than in past years? Where you, where you try to be as blind as you possibly can be? His answer has been no, but I do think it's a fair question to at least wonder if maybe some of those fears and anxieties, especially considering, I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, if, if uh, um, as much as you want your GM to be a freaking robot, uh, if, if Jordan Love busts, that's going to negatively reflect Brian Gutekunst. Uh, this next one I thought actually kind of shocked me the most in terms of his answer. Um, the question was essentially, do you weight positional value when you put together your board? And and I kind of thought that this would be an easy yes. <laughs> you have to put value on certain positions. I mean, they've talked about quarterback. I don't know how many times in terms of you know how, how valuable it is. But um, I had mentioned I think yesterday on the the podcast about Bijan and how my mind after he answered this question immediately went to Bijan. I think we look at that a little bit, yeah, certainly, um, but it doesn't affect how we build our board, you know? I mean, every individual player, regardless of their position, you know, we, we try to value. And um, But, yeah, there, I think you, when, as we go through it a little bit, there are um, – we do value certain positions over others. But at the end of the day, um, you know, you really don't know what your needs are going to be, like I was talking before. So um, just because a guy doesn't maybe, you know, fit one of your higher positional values, if he's a good football player and good all-around football player um, – to me, it's important to, that you don't overlook that. So, I mean, again, it's not like it doesn't matter. He's saying it does matter. And and I get that you don't build your board that way based on positional value. But, I mean, again, it really just brings up the Bijan question. As much as maybe we should just move on because it's not going to happen, you, you got to ask the question because there, this is a blue-chip player, right? Very unlikely that um, the Packers don't see him as a blue-chip player. Maybe they don't, but I, let's just assume that they do. I would say it's somewhat likely that he makes it to the Packers. So it's a blue chip player that is likely to make it to the Packers. I would say it's unlikely there are any other blue chip players available for the Packers. And so then the question then becomes, if this is the answer, why would you not take him? Now, the, the, the bigger question that would come to my mind is, why is every other team letting him pass? Are the Packers the only team with this philosophy, which would make it seem like Bijan should be gone sooner? But So I, I don't know. But it, Based on the answer to this question, it cannot be overlooked. And we could talk about it's not a need. We could talk about all these different things. But unless we're just going to say he's lying, you have to at least acknowledge this is a possibility. The fact that he said, look, if the guy's a, a stud, he cannot be overlooked was what he just said. And remember, we just drafted a linebacker last year in the first round. That is not a premium position. It is basically the running back of the defense as far as positional value. And Bijan is is clearly a higher profile, higher skill player than Quay was or any of the other linebackers that were available. So there are situations where we would do that, even with our first pick. So again, I don't think that's a thing, but I heard the answer to the question and my mind just immediately went to Bijan Robinson. Uh, again, not going to play it, but he did reference the third round. A question was asked, like, what the heck is going on with that? Um he brought up a couple of, of potential reasons why. Because you got to remember, all this stuff is small sample size. So whereas you look at it and say, man, it seems unlikely that you would miss this many times and you start to question process, it's still not that many times where it's statistically impossible, right? Improbable, yes. Impossible, no. So then you start to look at it and say, well, if you, if you factor in these variables, it could account for some of even the improbability. He mentioned uh, lack of opportunity, which... I'm quite positive he's looking directly at Amari Rodgers with that. 
um, because of Randall Cobb coming back. Um, potentially some other guys. I mean, even Sean Ryan. You know, the, there's there's not a lot of opportunity for him to be able to get in and do do his thing. Um, or, or to be honest, Josiah Deguara, even with the amount of tight ends that have been there. Um, he's been somewhat pushed down the depth chart. He'll have more opportunities this year. He also mentioned um, that's where the board gets the thinnest, which I don't necessarily understand that. And, you know, I mean, is is it not as thin in the sixth round? Or are you just saying that's where it begins to thin? Because then that doesn't really make sense because you're solid in the fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, seventh round, at least relatively. Um, but what he did say is, we have been looking at that, and they've certainly been looking at it from the standpoint of analytics, and he's hopeful that they're going to have a better result moving forward. So they have made some changes to process based on analytics and are hoping that we'll have a better outcome. So I like that answer. That is, like, my favorite answer. <laughs> we we just we, we got away from our scouting and our, and our tradition, which has been – Again, as great as I like the Packers process and everything, clearly the process is broken when it at least comes to the third round. So for them to step away from the uh, the, the playbook at hand and to say, let's dig into some data and some analytics and see where we can maybe make some tweaks and are going to apply that this year, that um, that makes me feel at least a little bit better about the third round. Not that I feel good about it. It's a curse until it's not a curse anymore. But um, I'm glad to hear that that was a thing other than, no, that's just a complete fluke. You don't know what you're talking about. You're an idiot. Um, the next thing that I actually thought was really, really interesting because um, when he the, the first half of the answer led me to feel one way, and then the second half with his little smirk on top of it was like, oh, hold on a second. So this is one of those things. Go to YouTube, General Manager Brian Gutekunst's press conference. Go to about 49 minutes. Um the question was essentially, how important was that pick swap? Here's the answer. Should you happen to do that? Like yeah, that? should I happen to do that? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, it, it, you know, if you look at the trade charts, it'll tell you what it, how much that's worth and things like that. Um, really, I have no idea until I know who's on the, on the clock when we're picking, right? So, uh, that, so that's the first half. And that was kind of my thought, right? Because a lot of people are saying things to the effect of, like, why would you do this? And, and my thought is, why would you not, right? It's like if somebody's willing to offer you 10 additional dollars on top of it, take the $10. Why would you not want to go from 13 to 15? You don't have to have a plan. Like, you know, if, if they offered it, would you say, no, nah, I don't really want that? Th th that doesn't make any sense. I took it because they offered it, right? Or because I'm trying to get as much as I can. I'd rather have 13 than 15. And so, yeah, he doesn't have a plan. He's just saying, I don't really know until we get there. But then he goes on to say this. Um, we'll see. Um, Big smirk but, on his uh, face. Yeah, if, if I were to do that, it would, I wouldn't be doing it. Uh, I'd be doing it because I thought it was important. So, again, it's, it's better to be able to see it because you got to see this smirk on his face the whole time. But when he answered the question, you got to say the reason he, he said that is because the reason he answered it in such a weird way is because the, in order to slip the question in, you have to assume that the deal isn't done. We don't know if that trade is going to happen. So it's sort of from the standpoint of if that were to happen. That's why he phrased it that way. So what he says is, if that were to happen, if there were a, a, a pick swap, it would be because I felt it was important. And then he has a big smirk on his face. You dirty dog. <laughs> what are you doing, Goot? So again, kind of flies in the face from in, in my again. Would they turn it down if it was offered? No, but um, at the same time, he he's making it very clear that that every piece of this is intentional. And if I push for it, then it's because I really wanted it for a certain reason. Wink, wink, nod, nod. So again, head over to forty nine minutes and push play and see what you think. A uh, question that's already been answered, but since, uh, again, we're not allowed to think Jordan Love is any good at anything and have to assume that he's some seventh-round scrub that we found off the street somewhere. Um, question, why do you think he's ready? Should be uh, self-explanatory, but here's Gutekunst. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, I think, obviously, we think we've seen steady growth um, through the, his three, first three years here. Uh, I've talked about the challenges that he faced with you know, no, no um, preseason early and, and going through some things. But, you know, last year I thought through through practice or a number of times because of Aaron's injuries where he had to kind of take over the ones during practice and, and some of the competitive areas. And I just think you start him to grow and grow and grow. And, um, again, he didn't get nearly as many opportunities as we would have liked last season during games. But when he did, he certainly answered the bell. And, and I think it's just natural maturation as a, as a person too. just, um, again, 
you guys know the what what is put on a quarterback in the National Football League's plate, a starting quarterback, is significant. And there's a lot to that, um, not only on the field. And they're going to go through a lot of challenges. Um, but I think we started to see him grow into that role and, and felt more confident. So he kept getting better. And then when we saw him play, he played really well. And also he's matured a lot to be able to, what we believe, handle the rigors of being an NFL starting quarterback. So is that enough for you? <laughs> Next question, and it, it's not something I even want to play because it's not that interesting, but it, it ties into sort of, again, sort of a mentality that, that people have as though there should be a universe where Rodgers and Devontae are still on the team and still continuing on for a very long time. The question essentially is, you know, in the last couple of years, you've, you've moved on from Devontae, you've moved on from Rodgers. Is there a, a scenario where you actually could have envisioned this happening? Well, freaking duh. What did you think that he was envisioning? Rodgers would play until he's 50? What a stupid question. But um, anyways, I'll play it anyways because uh, it's it's an important thing that will come up again later in the podcast. Well, that's the first part of it, yeah. I mean, that's part of the job, right? I mean, so absolutely. I mean, that's that's part of this job. Is you know, Obviously, Aaron was going to enter a time in his career where you know, he was going to be ending and we had to be prepared for the future. What? There was going to be a time when he wouldn't be the quarter? That's crazy. I don't know about that. And, and get prepared to try to move forward, right? So, um, so yeah, that's that's part of the National Football League, you know. So um, great players are going to come. They're going to go. Um, and you got to be prepared to, to continue to add good football you know, players to your roster so that your team can win. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't even know how to answer your question because it's so dumb. Um, yes, I envisioned a scenario in which maybe some of the guys would not be here anymore. And then usually what you do at that point is you add more pieces to try to continue with the, is this making sense? Are you following along or what, what are we, what are we doing here? But then it gets interesting because I, I think it's just pretty quickly rolls over into the next part. Um, this is where sort of that, um, what seemed to be a dig is is I don't I don't think it's necessarily meant to be an Aaron Rodgers dig, but it kind of felt that way. But I think it's more of a dig at the question because again, the question seems to be why did you allow this this great thing to collapse from underneath you? You made this decision to move on from the greatest quarterback and wide receiver, and and don't you think that's risky? Or like I don't know what part of this you're not understanding. <laughs> This is not how it went down. And again, I keep bringing this up because there'll be um, national commentators that, that speak from this sort of a mindset. But again, the idea that like everything's fine, Rodgers and Devontae just want to go on forever, and everybody else, like Zadarius and all those guys, they just want to keep playing and win Super Bowls for the Packers, and Gutekunst came along, and he's like, you know what, dude, I'm sick of this crap. Like, I'm drafting a guy, Jordan Love, and Rodgers is like, what? Why would you do that? That's terrible. He's like, because screw you, that's why. And Roger's like, oh, dude, okay, like, I'm really sorry if I hurt you or anything, but um, tell you what, why don't I play really, really well and see if that's good enough for you? And Gutekind says, shut up, stupid. And then Rogers wins back-to-back -back MVP, and he's like, hey, look, um, do you think I could get, like, a contract extension because I've done really good? And he's like, you're an idiot. Fine, I'll give you one. And then he's like, okay, great, sounds good. And then, then he's like, all right, hey, we had one bad year, but I, I had some struggles, and you didn't put any weapons around me and whatever. No, you're gone. I hate you. And, and by the way, Devontae's leaving. You know, like, what? It, what is this picture that people see that is so fictitious? I don't understand it. I'll just let this run through. But yeah, that's, 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 this is National Football League, so. Do you, is this risky? Is this risky? There's risk in that. Again, is this, is what risky? Is what risky? What, what is the risk that I'm taking? Getting rid of Rodgers? It's not a risk. It's just a thing that happened, right? I mean, it's, it's like if, if, if I crash my car and the cop shows up and he's like whoa that was risky what yeah i mean usually people stay on the road they don't like swerve off the road like do you think i chose this path is that what you think happened here you think i wanted this you think i deliberately steered my car into a fence post that's what you think is happening here that's the brilliant conclusion you came to it's like pulling over and getting gas in your car. Somebody's like, oh, getting a little low on gas. That seems risky. <laughs> what do you, what, what does that mean? Like, I didn't siphon it out of my own car. It ran out and now I'm refilling it. Like, what, what kind of a stupid comment is that? 
much of welding, but I mean, we were eight and nine last year. You know what I mean? So we're, we're trying to get better. You know what I mean? So I think that's important. So that was sort of the the supposed dig, um, but but again, it's it's important context on top of all this. Do you think it's risky, like throwing away this great thing? First of all, didn't throw it away. Rogers left. Devontae left, and I facilitated that, and I got us more compensation than anybody thought we could. But on top of that, um, is it risky? I mean, we were bad last year, and I'd like to be better because bad is not the goal. I'd like to move on to something better so that we could be good instead of bad. So I don't really understand your question, but thank you for asking it, and thank you for showing up today. Who was that that asked that question? And then uh, I think this might be the last question, if I remember properly, or that I wanted to discuss. But I want to play the entire question because I mentioned yesterday how absurd this... Uh, again, I, I think it's Wildy, but I don't know. Um, the way this guy asks questions <laughs> annoys me to no end. Just ask your question, dude. But here's here's the whole thing in its entirety. Brian, I'm, um, we're in this room in December. And there's certain things that get said from that podium that are pretty memorable. And you said, and I want to make sure I get this right, um, as I've been taught from the time I walked into this building, whatever comes with having great quarterbacks, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Remember saying that? Mm -hmm. um, Matt pointed out you haven't talked to the guy. Yeah. Um, he says some things that obviously are frustrating. Were there times when he started to question whether it was worth it with him? No, I think to begin, it, you know, there's always issues with players that you go through. And um, I think we have a great organization that works really hard to try to give these guys the best opportunities to succeed. Um, but no, I think, you know, again, we were, we're, we're chasing Super Bowls, right? And that's, a, that's an important thing. And that's what this is about. Um, there's, it's not always going to be easy. It's not going to always, you know, go smoothly, you know. Um, we were eight and nine last year, and um, as we move forward, it was more about what we we're going to do to get better. And, and so, I mean, again, he could not. He's he's taken a little bit off, but he could not be any more clear about this complete picture. Am I right? He what he's saying is we were willing to make some concessions. We were willing to put up with some nonsense because we're chasing Super Bowls, right? We did some things maybe we shouldn't have done. Because we're chasing a Super Bowl, we put up. We, you, sometimes you got to put up with some stuff when you're chasing Super Bowls. But sort of this idea that you know was was the, the, for example the way Rogers framed this that that a lot of people still believe. And and again, we'll get into the national media. At least one guy believes it. Freaking guy, I swear. But um, the way Rogers framed it is the Packers don't do the right things, and. I'm just going to try to make sure to help Brian Gutekunst to be better at what he does because, you know, it's important for the guys that are here that he does a better job in the way that he handles things. And then, you know, there, there was all these things about Brian Gutekunst flying out there to meet with the guy and they were working on communication styles and all this kind of stuff. And they came to certain, you know, uh, understandings of things and it, it, it the whole thing was made to seem as though Gutekunst acknowledged he was wrong and um, relinquished a lot of what he had done and, and allowed Rodgers to have a bigger voice and all this stuff because it was the right thing to do, not because you know we're just chasing Super Bowls, even though this is stupor, stupid, but I got to put up with a drama queen that has ridiculous demands, but it's what you got to do because, hey, chasing Super Bowls, right? He's very, very clearly pointing to the fact that that's not the case. Like, I, I put up with stuff... Because I had to, and sometimes you got to put up with some stuff because, you know, to, to get the end result. But then he pivots to, but last year we weren't good. And so then it became, how do we become good? So in other words, as soon as we're not chasing Super Bowls, I'm not putting up with one half of one second of your BS ever again. And that actually corroborates very much what Bob McGinn wrote a couple months ago, saying that everybody in this building is tired of his crap and they're not putting up with it anymore. And so even Tom Silverstein, when he wrote that late last year, they, that Brian Gutekunst made a comment to somebody that they were ready to move on. Yes, once you realize we're not competing for Super Bowls anymore, that's it. I'm not putting up with it. I'm not doing it anymore. Right? And, and even, it's kind of funny too, I'm... I'm, I'm adding more to it that that is less knowable but rogers talked about how he could tell things were kind of changing what do you think some of those things were probably some of the things that people were doing because of you being aaron Rodgers, the mvp we're not going to be doing anymore 
the way we communicate, the way that I treat you, the way that I gush over you, the way that I opine over you, and you know, even even those communication things that we talked about in the past, maybe we start reeling that back in anymore because I don't freaking care anymore. We're done. It's over. So the reality, I don't know because I wasn't in there, but Brian Gutekunst is very clearly giving his side of the story for the first time since this whole dust up between Aaron Rodgers and the Packers organization. And Brian Gutekunst's position is, yeah, all that was a bunch of BS. He's a diva. I put up with it because I had to because he's an MVP and we're trying to win a Super Bowl. I can't just walk away from the freaking guy. But when we don't even get to 500, nah, not putting up with it. We, we need to figure out how to move on, how to get better as a football team. And this is a part of that. And, um, you know, have a chance to win this thing. So, um, you know, as you're going through some of those things you're talking about um, and you're 13 and three or 13 and four and number one seed, you know, again, um, you know, this, that, that whole locker room, coaching staff, scouting staff, this whole organization, like we're trying to win a Super Bowl, right? So um, you'll put up with a lot to try to change. Did you hear what he just said? That Now, remember, this is what I've talked about before. I don't think it's just Gutekunst that is kind of fed up with Rodgers. He specifically pointed to everybody from the coaching staff to the training staff to the locker room that all of these guys are putting up with stuff because you're chasing Super Bowls. Right? Let me play that again. Um, you know, as you're going through some of those things you're talking about, um, and you're 13 and three or 13 and four and number one seed, you know, again, um, you know, this, that, that whole locker room, coaching staff, scouting staff, this whole organization, like we're trying to win a Super Bowl, right? So um, you'll put up with a lot to try to chase that. And we will. We'll continue to. But, um, yeah, it's always, it's never, it's never really easy. There's always difficult things. So it is what it is. And, again, not everybody's the same. I'm sure there are coaches that love Rodgers, like his quarterback coach. I know that there are players like David Bakhtiari that love him. And there's people that can't stand him, just like there's players that can't stand Brian Gutekunst and everything in between. I mean, individuals have individual preferences and all that kinds of stuff. Um, that's why, like, individual videos of people's opinions are, are relatively useless because most of them are, are pretty biased on on where they stand on things, right? You're talking about, um, what was it, like the the listening to Jets fans' opinions on this thing is, is, is clearly biased in terms of what we're talking about now, like Rich Eisen. His pride is also getting in the way, but he was never being honest to begin with. But then also like the, the Richard Sherman thing, he came out and like, oh, you, you guys are treating Rodgers like blah, 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 blah. Like he's angry about it. Richard Sherman is a very close friend of Aaron Rodgers. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. I mean, that's Rodgers' buddy sticking up for, for Rodgers because a lot of the, the, those guys are angry that Packers fans aren't upset. They want Packer fans to be sitting there weeping and crying, saying, what will we ever do now? We're doomed. We, we will never have success again. And the fact that we're not doing that, again, you got uh, Richard Sherman, you've got Adam Shine, you've got, uh, what's his name from Days of Our Lives or whatever, the guy with the big old jaw, telling you, like, Packer fans, you don't understand, you're never going to, uh, but like, dude, okay, shut up, good Lord. Like, they, they just, they... Until we will just sit and and begin weeping, they will not stop. And Bears fans are the same way. They're 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 just they they're furious that we won't just acquiesce to to handing over the division. You're being delusional if you think that Jordan Love won't be garbage. Like you no, know, you're an idiot. That's all that is. I'm required to believe what? We're never gonna have success again. Like I I just know that we're rebuilding. I know we're gonna be terrible. I just like I'm supposed to know that. Gutekunst is garbage, just like I'm supposed to know that Jordan Love is bad. No, I don't know any of that, and neither do you. So stop saying stupid crap. Just because you're you're upset that we are, are aren't all just sitting here weeping over Aaron Rodgers. I'll be honest, I wish that things were a little bit different with Aaron Rodgers. A lot of players that leave, there's this big, you know, like, oh man, that's so sad and all that kind of stuff. And and I I, I had that moment, strangely enough, with with JJ's video that he made. It was actually quite well done. The uh, the office or whatever. It, it, it was a moving thing, but it's like, we, we, this has been so built up. We've known that he's leaving since, like, what, February? Maybe March? I don't remember. It's been a long time on top of just being ready to move on and everything else. Like, it's hard to sit here and all of a sudden just be overcome with emotion. Like, this is, we've had time to, and, and, and that's, by the way, coming from someone I've told you, I've been preparing for him to leave since, like, 2018. I thought we were done. I thought we might have been done after 2017. The guy got hurt. Like, we, you know, 
So I've had a lot of time to prepare. And we drafted Jordan Love in 2020. So I've, I've, I've been preparing for him to take over since that time. So yeah, I mean, it's not like all of a sudden I'm going to act like I'm shocked and just fall to my knees like, what? They traded him? I thought he was going to be here forever. I had no idea. What are we going to do? There are a lot of people that are angry that we're not acting that way. It's like, oh, you're a homer. It's like, no, I, 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 I have no idea if we're going to be good or not. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying I don't know. Oh, okay, homer. What, you think Jordan Love's going to be good? I didn't say that. I said I don't know. What, you think you're, you think you're just going to, you think you're just going to replace Devontae? I, I, I don't, I don't know. Do you know? Oh, yeah, I know. I know. I, I've been there, buddy. I've been there. I've seen it. You don't know because you're a spoiled Packer fan. I know. I'm like, okay, you're all idiots. How about that? You're all stupid. Anyways, on that note, since I'm getting fired up, there was one more thing, but since we're already 44 minutes into it, um, essentially the, I will summarize it as best as I can. You can go listen for yourself. It's about 58-ish minutes in. Um, But the question was like, hey, so you said you were going to change some of your communication stuff and whatnot. Like, is that just for Rodgers or like, is that going to stick around? And he more or less said like, yeah, maybe some of that will kind of stay. But for the most part, that was just to appease Rodgers. And now that he's gone, everybody can just suck it and I do what I want. Which again... Think how you want to think, but that's exactly what I want my GM to say. I don't want him beholden to the whims of people who are not GMs. I don't care what the quarterback, wide receiver, or anybody else thinks about the roster construction. (laughs) At all. Anyways, let's go ahead and take a break right here. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy is where you can support the podcast. Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry is where you can support the uh, charity that we are supporting. Find them at fertilegroundranch.org. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. Anyways, um, I want to spend the rest of our time um, just making fun of people for, you know, I don't know. I I should be nicer. But let's just say I have some corrections to make in terms of what a few people have said. I'm going to leave it at that. So I want to start with this. I mentioned it before, um, but here it is. It's only two minutes long, but it's it's Rich Eisen's take when he found out about the Aaron Rodgers thing. Again, Rich Eisen, a uh, very anti-Rodgers person that has been saying the Packers have no leverage whatsoever. The Jets have all the leverage. And if Packer fans think the Packers are going to get anything, they're out of their minds because it would be stupid for the Jets to do anything, blah, 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 blah. Here it was his reaction to finding out that the Packers got a second round pick this year, a, a swap of the first round picks, and a more than likely first round pick next year, and no give back. Here is his reaction to that. I had to pull over to the side of the road because some news just crossed. And I saw it stopping at a red light because I had to see why is my phone buzzing like crazy. Of course, I wasn't looking at my phone while driving. I don't do that. I'm safe. I'm responsible. And I know things like I knew this trade was going to happen. I told y'all the Packers had no choice but to send Rodgers to the Jets. (sighs) You D-bag. (laughs) <laughs> I know things. You know what? You were wrong about every single detail with the exception of one, and that is that the deal would get done, which nobody actually thought it wouldn't. In terms of 50-50, like, gun to your head, is it going to happen, yes or no? Very few people would have said no. And then, your conclusion, your summary of all this, is the Packers had no choice but to do it. If they had no choice, why did they get so much? 
Why did the Jets give up more than a fourth-round pick in 2025 for Aaron Rodgers? Because you don't know how to come to conclusions other than to make yourself sound a lot smarter than you are, which is ironic because you're making yourself sound like an idiot in your attempt to make yourself sound smart. What do you mean? You knew it all along. You've been wrong the entire time. And now it's happened. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers is a New York Jet. Let me just say that again. Aaron Rodgers is a New York Jet. Yeah, he's so excited. Coming from the guy that's been mocking Aaron Rodgers for an entire year, or, or basically longer than that, ever since the vaccine thing came out. He has been mocking the guy. He can't stand the guy. But now, all of a sudden, he's pretending, I love it. He loves Rodgers. He loves that the Jets did this. He loves that it's done. And he was exactly right the whole time. He is so full of crap. Now, is this going to work out? Who knows? I know the Favre thing was a disaster. Rodgers is a different player. And guess what? It's better than the alternative. In a big way. Let's see how this one works out. Put the Jets on a totally different plane of national interest. And yeah, I just used the word jet and plane in the same sentence. Not my first rodeo. Yeah, Plus, genius. I'm pretty giddy. Two things. First of all, I do like telling folks that something's gonna happen then it happens wow wow no i I, we're all very impressed that you said that you think that this deal is going to get done and then it got done no very impressed with you i do like being right but one thing i like more than being right i do too but i like when i'm actually right about stuff not stupid crap right and i also tend to have a habit of of admitting when i'm wrong about stuff unlike freaking you is that aaron Rodgers is a new york jet What's funny is you weren't right about anything, and you actually don't like this. I'm sure that you like the fact that your team is probably, I don't want to say irrelevant, because we constantly have to hear about the Jets, despite them being stupid and garbage, because uh, all of you people are Jets fans. But um, but the fact that you actually have a chance at not sucking for the first time in a long time, uh, I'm sure that excites you. But uh, yes, the, the, the universe is punishing... Rich Eisen, for some reason, I don't know what it is. I guess I should be happy about this because this is this is a guy who is absolutely miserable right now. The Jets gave up way more money for a guy that he freaking hates with with the passion of a thousand sons because he chose not to get vaccinated. And now that guy who you've been mocking and ridiculing is your quarterback, and you have to sit there and pretend that you freaking love it and that you love the guy, and you can't make fun of him anymore. So I should I should actually be much happier about this i guess i am happy this is this is karma to the nth degree this this is such a beautiful thing watching rich eisen and the rest of these guys who have hated aaron Rodgers with a passion i mean the entire jets fan base probably hated the guy the 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 new york media absolutely hated the guy and now you got to sit there and pretend you love him and pretend that you love the compensation (laughs) sucks to be you dude best of luck to you arrogant freaking guy my goodness but anyways that was the one i told you about rich eisen 28 minutes ago from my vantage point drop this video the words i love to say into a microphone i told you so <laughs> okay i knew this was going to happen how many times oh my gosh hey, this thing could go a, into the what a summer thick limb you're going no, out on no, 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 I mean, no. This could go into the summer. The 49ers might swoop in. Rogers might change his intentions. He might retire. He might. So, de- so what you're what you're talking about is is leverage that you said didn't exist. You're saying that all of those things were fake, right? They don't exist. There were no other teams. There's no other. There is no leverage for the Green Bay Packers. So again, I come back to you. None of those things are real. Therefore, there's no leverage. Explain the compensation. Well, explain the compensation, right? I, I was told that the, the Packers have to get this done. If they don't get it done, they are screwed. They also have no leverage because there's no other teams interested. They have no other options, and they are screwed if, if this deal doesn't get done. Bankrupt franchise. Why did it get done? Why did it get done so quickly? Why did it get done for so much? The fact that you think that this proves anything regarding anything that you've been saying is shocking to me. And again, I, I've been saying I don't buy the 49ers thing. I'm not talking about that specifically. But more generally, no leverage, no options. 
Nothing. Everything you've been saying is true. Explain the compensation. He doesn't want to talk about the compensation. He just wants to talk about the fact that it got done, and somehow that proves not only that he was right about that, but he was right about everything, including the leverage. Uh, Before we get to any super crazy ones, I did want to highlight this one as well, just because uh, although there's nothing horrifically bad about this, it's still sort of this mentality that like, oh, just calm down. It's We kind of already knew like everybody. And it's just, in my opinion, it's blatantly false. This is what Daniel Jeremiah's instant takeaway from the trade was. What's up, everybody? Uh, I'm here in Kansas City for the draft and uh, doing a bunch of radio interviews. Quite honestly, I was uh, just in between interviews and jumped on Twitter and was going to see if you Darvish's hamstring was okay. Yeah, you know. Reasonable thing to do. And then I saw the Aaron Rodgers trade. So I uh, want to give you some reaction on that one real quick. If you look at it here, Aaron Rodgers, uh, the 15th pick and the 170 pick. And then uh, going to Green Bay, they get the, the pick swap there, 13. 42 in the second round, 207, and a conditional two next year that could go to a one. Uh, I see a lot of people kind of you know, having strong takes on this or this team got fleeced or that team you know did well. I actually think it's it's – pretty fair and i feel like it's what we've talked about for quite some time uh we talked about a two this year we talked about a conditional pick next year that could be a one uh contingent on play time or performance and now if this is what everybody's been saying then that's fine and i apologize for missing it but i haven't been seeing that at all based on play time or performance show me one person again maybe i just missed it it's entirely possible that i've just been looking at the wrong people that said, going to be a two this year, and then a two next year that is likely to become a one, and no give back. Because everything that I have seen is more or less two this year, maybe a two next year, minus something if he doesn't play, which he isn't likely to play. Who has been talking about a conditional second round pick that is going to become a first round pick and it's also something that is probably what 80 to 90 percent likely to happen i haven't seen that so i don't know i'll i'll have to go look i mean jeremiah is more of like the the i mean i guess it's technically draft stuff but it's not like scouting prospects or anything right because that's kind of his background is more of the scouting side not so much you know nfl commentating stuff not that that's a thing that you Whatever, but like I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, and all, all of his articles are about the, the, the draft in terms of mock drafts and all that kind of stuff. So maybe he's talked about it on his podcast, and I, I, again, I've just missed it. And this is what everybody's been saying, or what he's been saying. I have not heard that. I have not seen that in any of the articles that I've been reading. Really, that's what this is. Um, in order to get the deal to the finish line, to me, on the outside looking in, it looks like what we would call a little sweetener was added which is just, okay, those are the real parameters of the deal, but let's just get a little sweetener. So sweetener is we'll uh, we'll pick swap 15 and 13, not real difference there. And then you have 170 and 207, not much difference there. So I I think this is exactly what was a fair deal, what we talked about previously about what would happen. It's really a two this year and a conditional two that could go to a one next year and then just a little sweetener on top. So I thought it made sense for both teams. Made sense is one thing. This is what we've talked about is another thing. Demonstrate to me that that's what you said, and, and, and I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. But I have seen two and then two minus, not two and then one plus. Because that's what we're talking about. It's one thing to say, yeah, we said a two and then a two. Okay, but you said a two and then a conditional two that is unlikely to become a one and a give back, and you didn't mention anything about a pick swap. I'm not saying Daniel Jeremiah, I'm just saying from what I've heard. And then the, the reason this annoys me is because I'm not sitting here trying to say that I, I, I don't think I've ever said the word fleeced, at, at least maybe on Twitter. I said it as a joke or something, but I don't think anybody necessarily got fleeced because it is relatively close. I mean, maybe they got fleeced from the standpoint of I think it's ridiculous to even offer the lowball offers, but it just bothers me from the standpoint of trying to push a narrative that just isn't is just blatantly untrue. Why are you doing that? I, I, I don't understand why. The consensus isn't we just look at the information and then comment on it properly. Instead, we have to reframe things from a standpoint that is just completely false because we want the conclusion to be a certain way. Not We care about the conclusion, not the reality. The, the, the details don't matter. The facts don't matter. The facts are malleable. 
The conclusion is not. It should be the other way around. The conclusion is malleable, dependent on the facts. And I, I you know, I, I don't have anything against Daniel Jeremiah. I've never heard him say anything that annoys me, but that's what it feels like we're doing here. And so I understand saying, look, look, fleeced is ridiculous. I do think the Packers uh, got a better deal than we were expecting, but but it was a good deal for both parties. But he didn't say that. He took it to the next step saying, yeah, this is what we knew it was going to be all along. That makes it feel like one of the boys in New York media just trying to run damage control. Unless, again, I'm incorrect. I, I'm, I'm willing to uh, anybody that wants to dig up Daniel Jeremiah and the conversations they've had on their podcast, if you've heard it, have, it a- have access to it, what they said they think is going to happen. And again, I'm still, I, I have to do the work myself, but I'm still waiting for anyone to show me, anyone that said the Packers will get this or more, not a fraction less, because everything I saw was at least marginally less. For reference, both second round picks and a pick swap would be less. Then you get this freaking dope. Again, it, it's amazing to me because you actually think that this is going to help you win your argument, and all it does is make you look even dumber than you were. Everybody knows that as soon as this happened, Mike Florio was an idiot. As soon as this happened, everybody was so excited to run over to Mike Florio and say, ha, 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 you dummy. And there's no escaping it. You said what you said. Everybody heard it. Everybody knows what your position was on this issue in terms of the Packers not having leverage and and how this is all going to pan out. And so the best thing you can do is just sort of take the L on that, right? He decided not to do that. He found a way as a lawyer, good for him, you putting that law degree to use for for once, he found a way to uh, find a technicality and wiggle his way out of it. Technically, we don't know for sure who had the leverage, although it clearly seems that the Packers had plenty, based on, again, the Packers getting the better value. It's entirely possible that, wait for it, the Jets had real leverage in the Aaron Rodgers trade talks. For whatever reason, they chose not to use it. Hey, technically that could be the case. Maybe, maybe, you gotta prove me wrong here, the Jets did have all the leverage, they just didn't feel like using it. Again, he, he really thinks he sounds smart lawyering his way out of this. All this does is make him look like a bigger idiot. Because you are already wrong once, people show up to make fun of you, and then you put this out there and make yourself wrong twice. And you can sit back and say, well, technically, any, all you want. Everybody reading it already knows. And look, even the title of the article is, in the end, the Packers fleeced the Jets for Aaron Rodgers. So he, he to some degree, takes sort of a, a half a loss. I don't know exactly what his stance was on, on who would win the, the, the battle between the two. That's certainly a, uh, more of a Pat McAfee thing. But again, the, 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 what he thinks to be a brilliant maneuver here is I will concede that the, uh, the, the Packers won, but I will not concede that I was wrong about leverage because that's a more consequential thing for him. He's a brilliant lawyer. He understands these things, right? This is basic mathematics, right? He should be able to figure this out. If he's wrong about that, that's pretty embarrassing. And of course, he looks at it and says, I wasn't wrong. So rather than just saying, I guess I was wrong, he would rather say, I was right, but the universe doesn't make sense, right? It's like, you ever seen those, those flat earth things? You ever see the videos where flat earthers go out, try to prove that the earth is flat and that um, every one of their science experiments comes out to be not as they anticipated? I forgot what the first one was, but there, there's a famous clip of, of using essentially a laser. They went really, really far away, and they had a laser, and they cut two holes in a, in a piece of paper or something, put them on sticks, and they put them at the same height or sea level or whatever. And the point is, if there's no curvature of the earth, the laser goes straight through, and I'll be able to see the laser on the other side. If there is curvature, the laser will not come through this hole. And so he shoots the laser, and he's like, yeah, I got nothing, man. I, I, I don't see anything. It's really weird. And then he, he's forced to do the thing he doesn't want to do. And he says, why don't you go ahead and raise that up a little bit? And so he, he raises it up above his head. And then sure enough, there's the laser. And he says, huh, interesting. Now, I don't know what ended up happening to these flat earth guys. But here's the point. This is the intersection. You have two choices. Number one, the best possible conclusion here is that I was wrong about the curvature of the earth. Number two, I guess we've all been wrong about how physics works this entire time. Is it physics, the light and all that? and I guess geometry could be wrong too, right? I guess, I guess science has been wrong all along. Because one thing I know for sure is that the Earth is flat. But of course, we have nothing to back that up anymore because now science is just subjective. That's what, that's what Florio's doing right now. He chose the second path. The conclusion he came to 
was the Packers have no leverage and the Jets have all the leverage. The science experiment was this trade that went down. There was no laser for Florio. Couldn't see it. Rather than saying, I guess I was wrong, he decided to go the other route and say, well, I guess they just chose, they had it and just didn't choose to use it. It's really weird. Several weeks ago, we argued that the Jets should act like they were from New York or New Jersey. Instead, they did a deal that wouldn't have even qualified for a set of steak knives at uh, Glenary Glen Ross. I don't know what that steakhouse or something. Glen Gary Glen Ross. Sorry, Jets fans, but your favorite team got fleeced. They had leverage. They just chose not to use it. Man, life is so much easier when you just don't have to run away from all this stuff. When you can just accept the reality. You know how much easier this is to try to figure out the situation when you just accept the facts for what they are? For some reason, they chose not to use it. So now you got to come up with a reason for why? That's a lot of work, man. And then he just regurgitates all his own points as though this is... In other words... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say everything I said before to prove that I was right before in the past. They chose not to say to the Packers, this guy is never playing for you again. What are you going to do? Pay him $60 million to sit on the bench? We're in no hurry. He knows the offense. He doesn't like to participate in the offseason anyway. We can do that deal at the start of training camp. We can do it at the start of the regular season if need be. Right. No, no, we heard you say that the first time, and that didn't happen. And your conclusion is they just felt like giving up way more than they needed to. Okay. He does bring up a really good point in this article, though, that is quite funny in terms of the, the how important that flip swap is. Right, Daniel Jeremiah, that doesn't mean much. Even the trade charts, like, I don't know, it's like 100. It's like a third round pick, which is not nothing, by the way. I mean, maybe to the Packers it is, but a third round pick is not nothing. But who did they switch with? The Packers. But who did they go behind? The Patriots. <laughs> they were one spot ahead of the Patriots. Now they're one spot behind the Patriots. What's going to happen when the Patriots take a player that the Jets really need? Patriots end up taking that offensive tackle that the Jets needed. Oh, is that going to sting? So anyways, there's that conclusion from that genius. And then finally, we've got a guy that I swear I I don't know anything about the guy. I know his name, but I I couldn't tell you a single other thing about him. And then he made this ridiculous video a while ago about the Aaron Rodgers situation, and it just set me off because it's like, this is the dumbest crap I've ever heard. Well, he's back for round two, basically saying the same thing just because he's a freaking idiot. Yeah, just a lot of appreciation for him. What a soundbite. Players like that don't come around very often. You think, Brian Gutekis? You did this, Goody. You did it. You ruined the relationship with Aaron Rodgers and traded away the greatest Packer of all time. Who is it, by the way, that taught people that in radio you have to have a weird, like, stupid-sounding voice? You did this, Goody. You're the one who did it. <laughs> what is it? Is that, like, appealing to people? We People want to hear that sound when they listen to the radio? Don't you know? <laughs> it's like uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off when uh, What's-His-Name does the Abe Froman voice. You did this, Goody. You did that. So when I do that voice to try to make fun of people for how stupid they sound, that's his real voice. He actually sounds like that. Apparently, he's the voice I do when I try to talk about how stupid people sound. Again, this is what I was talking about before in the Brian Gutekunst press conference when I said we'd be talking about this later. This idea that somehow Gutekunst chose this path. You did this. You chose this. You broke the relationship. You freaking pile of horse crap. That's kind of mean. But how stupid do you have to be? Man, shame on you. I want you to stare at this boy. Shame board. on you. Oh and I goodness. don't want to hear from a Packer fan, oh, Aaron, the drama, the will he, won't he. Aaron okay. Rodgers. So he's, he's laid out the parameters. I'm not allowed to say will he, won't he, uh, something or another. I don't know. Drama. Can't talk about drama, which I don't talk about drama. I said, again, I like the drama. I'm all for it. Keep keep coming uh, with the drama. But... Um, so, so that's what I'm not allowed to talk about, but I'm supposed to look at the board. Let's look at the board. Okay. Career accomplishments, because that's relevant. 18 seasons with the Packers. Oh, wow. We should keep him because he's been here for 18 years. Okay. What, why else should we keep him? Four-time MVP. Okay. So he won the MVP in the past. Okay. So we should have kept him. Again, I understand we can't keep him, and he wanted to retire. I just, let's just one step at a time here, okay? Gutekunst chose this. He wanted him gone because he hated him. Here's the reasons we should have kept him instead of running him out on a rail. Super Bowl champion um, a long time ago. Okay. So that's great. So he won the Super Bowl once. So that's why you can't let him go. 10 time Pro Bowler. Okay. That's great. Four-time first-team All-Pro, 
Best touchdown to interception ratio in NFL history. Fifth most passing touchdowns in NFL history. Okay, cool. Um, boy, that's compelling. I hope he doesn't put up something of Dan Marino or something, because I guess then we'd have to go out and get Dan Marino to come play for us. Because apparently what you've done in the past, no matter how long ago it was, is the only thing you need to do to figure out what you should do in the future. Did I talk about wrong things? I, I didn't talk about drama, right? And I didn't say will he, won't he, so I think we're good. So um, Adam Shine says, Gutekunst did this. He broke the relationship by being a big meanie to Aaron Rodgers and forced him out. And now this guy that won the Super Bowl like 15 years ago is going to leave and he should stay here even though he said he didn't want to stay here and he was going to retire and the only reason he's playing is because he hates Brian Gutekunst and he has a chip on his shoulder. But but still, he should be here and he should, like if he was, if Gutekunst was nicer and we didn't have Jordan Love, then we'd have old Aaron Rodgers that was here and maybe he wouldn't want to retire, although maybe he would. And But still, then, okay. I'm a little confused, but I, I think I'm with you. So... Past career accomplishments are why he should stay, even though that's not an option. All right, moving on. There's 18 seasons of gold with Green Bay. Okay. Four-time MVP, yes. won a Super Bowl, and before anyone says, well, he only won one. Well, I mean, go back to Mike McCarthy, Brandon Bostick in Seattle. Everybody else is fault, I know. that Brian Gunakis didn't give him the weapons that he needed. And yeah, he had no weapons, right? Mike McCarthy's a piece of garbage. Ted Thompson was garbage. Right, I mean, he had good defenses sometimes, but sometimes he didn't. He had elite wide receivers his entire career, but he didn't have any weapons. He had elite offensive lines his entire career, but that doesn't count, right? Like, what about that one year you didn't have special teams, right? Remember how bad the special, like, there's that. So, like, there's excuses. So, I mean, excuses. But, um, yeah, otherwise, I totally get it. Listen, the guy is just majestic, and you want He's to talk majestic. about it. He's majestic. What is this? Since when... I don't understand. I, th I thought everybody hated Aaron Rodgers. As a Packer fan, I feel like I've done nothing but defend Aaron Rodgers. Everybody in the national media freaking hated the guy. Half of the Packer fans hated the guy. I spent this entire time doing nothing but defending the guy. Then he leaves, and everybody everybody loves him. And I got to suddenly defend the organization because he is this prince of all princes that has been slighted. The only thing, again, that I can think is the hatred is really for Green Bay. That's the only thing I can... I don't understand this. Where was Adam Shine when the guy was like, hey, uh, I don't feel like getting the, the vaccine, and everybody was like, I hope you die, you grandma killer, and where was Shine on that one? I don't know. He didn't feel like showing up. He didn't feel like talking about Super Bowls and MVPs at that time, but now that he decided to retire, now we got to talk about Gutekunds as a piece of garbage. Brian okay. Gunekis, he started this. I mean, Aaron Rodgers never talked about his future before. The only thing he ever said, he said it to me. He never talked about his future before? What does that even mean? Me on numerous occasions on my Sirius XM radio show, I wanted to retire a Packer, I wanted to be there forever. Until, you know, Brian Gooney in, in 2020 decided, well, we're going to take the replacement for Aaron Rodgers. Okay, th th this is wildly incorrect. Um, he has been unhappy with the organization he was unhappy with the organization before i shouldn't say before gutekunst got there but before he took over right he had problems with the organization with i mean some of the people he talks about the way that they were handled on the way out that was ted thompson that was not brian gutekunst handling that situation he had issues with mike mccarthy he has issues with matt lafleur he has issues with brian gutekunst right so that's not true. As far as talking about his retirement, he has been talking about it because he's getting old and people ask him about it. And yes, he has said up to this day he would have liked to that to have been the situation, but that's not always the way that it goes. And he understands that. But of course, the conversation of him moving on someday, and again, he's talked about it, not even in terms of like, well, I hate it, I want to get out of here, just in terms of like, look, I'm getting old, I understand, like, you know, as you get older, you got to start thinking about these things, and I've been thinking about these things. The again, this idea. What, what what do we think? He's twenty five years old and he wants to continue playing for the next ten years. But Brian Gutekunz ruined that. He's been contemplating retirement for a long time. He's a super rich guy that doesn't like football as much anymore. By his own admission, he when he said he wanted to retire, why do you think he wanted to retire? Because he loved football so much. He said something to the effect of "Screw this! I don't want to do this anymore." So, <laughs> I mean, come on. Instead of giving him help at the wide receiver position, we begged for T. Higgins for Aaron Rodgers. Nobody did that. 
Nobody did that. Show me Adam Shine begging for T. Higgins for Aaron Rodgers. Nobody did that. Nobody did that. That's bull crap. That's absolute bull crap. Aside from the fact where, again, going through this for the hundredth time, wide receiver was not the issue. He had the number one wide receiver in all of football. Well, that doesn't count. You need a second one. They had a second one. They had a number two, and they had a number three. And again, go back into the playoffs, and I will demonstrate to you the number two wide receiver getting 105 yards and a touchdown in that game, and it still wasn't good enough. It was not a wide receiver problem. It's been a much bigger problem than just wide receiver. But yes, we need to pretend that that, the, that this poor, neglected Aaron Rodgers, who's had great receivers and great offensive lines and great running backs and great coaches and great GMs his entire career, has been so poorly neglected by this garbage organization who has garbage GMs and garbage coaches and garbage wide receivers and garbage offensive lines and garbage running backs. That's what we're saying, by the way, Packer fans who agree with Adam Shine. All these guys are garbage. And Rodgers has been neglected. So so everybody else needs to, to fall on the freaking grenade rather, rather than just acknowledging we had a good run, wasn't perfect, he did his best, they did their best, it was fine, he certainly had good enough teams to win with, he certainly had opportunities to win with, certainly wish it would have been a little bit better with defenses here, special teams here, this, that, or the other, I get all that. Rather than just acknowledge, no, everybody get the entire team the entire organization, every coach, every G, everybody needs to jump on that freaking grenade for him. That's it. That's Shine's position. We beg for Michael Pittman. Instead, Jordan Love. So it's like in kindergarten. No. It, 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 <laughs> he, <laughs> okay. It's like kindergarten. Yeah, it is like kindergarten where everybody's lying all the time and pooping their pants, which is what you're doing. You're lying and you're pooping your pants right now. You started it. And then Aaron Rodgers responded by... <laughs> He accuses people of being in kindergarten, and the next words out of his mouth, you started it. What a freaking joke this guy is. Back-to-back MVPs. The Green Bay Packers never... Which he said, by his own admission, why did he even win the MVPs? Why? Because they drafted Jordan Love. So if you take away Jordan Love like you like, you don't get the MVPs, do you? In fact, you probably get a decline of Aaron Rodgers much faster. We already saw the decline. Since 2015, the guy had one good year, and it was in 2016. 2015 was not great. That was when that was the first year we looked at it, and we're like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? Remember? I think it was the Olivia Munn year. It's like, I don't know. It must be something with her, because something's off with him. And 2016 was great. 17, he got hurt. 18 was bad. All right? So all of a sudden, it's like, what the heck is going on? 19 was, was better, but still, like, something feels a little weird. Like, it's a little discombobulated, whatever. I don't know. The cracks started showing. Then they drafted Love, and then he won MVP. And, and listen, I'm, I've been the guy the whole time saying, I don't buy it. I don't believe that he won MVP just because of it. But guess what? He went on television, YouTube channel, whatever, and told the whole world that that is the reason. So you don't get to play both of these. You shouldn't have gotten Jordan Love because he went on to win MVPs. Without Jordan Love, there are no MVPs. So try again, genius. Never going to be the same. I mean, the New York Jets, to me, are a top four team in the AFC. No, no, I don't think so. There, I mean, I mean, Buffalo's better than them for sure. I'm just staying in their own division. I don't know that Miami isn't better than them. Tua was a better quarterback than Rodgers last year, so to assume that Rodgers is going to be better is faulty. Miami has better wide receivers, whether you want to admit that or not. The, the Garrett Wilson humping has been kind of ridiculous. The, the 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 Miami Dolphins have at least one receiver that's better than him, if not two. The Miami Dolphins have a better running back. The Miami Dolphins have a better offensive line, arguably have a better coach, if not similar, except one guy is an offensive guy and one guy is a defensive guy. I mean, one organization's had success, the other hasn't. Could just say it's the quarterback, I don't know, but I'm just saying. Defense is probably going to be the Jets, but not massively because Miami actually has a pretty solid defense. So I don't even know if they're the second best in their own division. The only way we just make that automatic is to assume that Aaron Rodgers automatically is the MVP. And then on top of that, we have to assume that he's uh, gotten in great with his guy. Oh, by the way, he's the MVP with a terrible offensive line, which I don't see exactly how that happens, but let's just pretend. So he's the MVP. Right, because, yeah, they they, they have a couple draft picks. And then, uh, as everybody knows, rookie offensive linemen just come in and are dominant. I get it. And, um, yeah, Alan Lazard, who the Packers, by the way, 
garbage organization for allowing Alan Lazard to be the number two guy in Green Bay. And the, with the Jets, you think he's not the number two guy there? You're out of your mind. I don't care who you think the number two is. I'm telling you it's Alan Lazard. He might even be the number one. We'll see how much of a, a relationship Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers can form. So I know the Bills and the Chiefs are ahead of them. Cincinnati is very likely ahead of them. I think Miami might be ahead of them. So rather than looking up the rest of the teams in the AFC, I'll just assume that that's good enough. As we mentioned, the Green Bay Packers and Jordan Love are going to be lucky to win four games. I mean, why do you say that? Again, th- th- this is where we're not even having a debate anymore. You're just telling me and everybody else that you're an idiot. You're completely incompetent. Because not only are you just guessing, despite all the variables that are that are going to happen over there with the Jets, we don't know anything about Jordan Love. But again, this is what I'm saying. You are forced as a Packer fan to accept that Jordan Love will not be good. The Packer fans, the, the, the Packers with Jordan Love will be lucky to win four games. Why do you say that? How do you, what, what do you, tell me one thing you know about Jordan Love as the starter for the Green Bay Packers. What's one thing you know about him, about him and his competence level? The, 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 it's, a, it's shocking to me how many people will go back to his college career to try to make some kind of a point. Like, we, we have to disregard the Eagles game, but yet we can go back to uh, freaking Utah State against LSU <laughs> with a, a brand new offensive line and, and a brand new coaching staff and everything else like that. That matters, but his actual growth that we saw as a Green Bay Packers quarterback with the Green Bay Packers, that needs to be disregarded. Amazing. Look at the numbers. Jordan Love should have never been a first round pick. What what numbers? This is <laughs> This is his 2021 regular season stats week 9 against the Chiefs. That's what he put up. This is this is what we have to this is it. Uh, 19 of 34, 190 yards, 5.6 yards per attempt, one touchdown, one interception. Justin Fields has been playing for two years. I'm not allowed to judge him. The Kansas City Chiefs game, where he was thrown into the fire last minute and expected to be the guy, under pressure the entire game, I'm talking .5 seconds before somebody's in his face, and we, by the way, almost won the game, and, and that's the only... Why didn't he put up the stats for the Eagles game? This is, this is how you know this is not an actual intelligent person making an intelligent argument. This is, again, about the conclusion is what matters. The facts are malleable. We can alter the facts. That's fine. There is zero reason why... First of all, that you would ever even put up these numbers as evidence of anything because the small the smallness of the sample size is hilarious. I can go back and find a, okay, we have to judge Aaron Rodgers with the Jets based on what he did against Detroit last year. And that's a lot more than 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 this. There's more numbers here. But the fact that he skipped over the Eagles game and then went back to the Chiefs game and said he shouldn't have been a first round pick because of that is freaking hilarious. Based on what? Based on what? You absolute hack. This was a project player. He was available last year via trade yet teams that need quarter. Oh. He was a project player. Yeah, he is a first round project that is considered a long term project. Good thing he spent three years for the Packers behind Aaron Rodgers, right? You freaking walking dunce. Quarterback, nobody, no weak quarterback draft one year ago. No one wanted. And it, what, what, he was available for trade. Zero people have ever said that that he was available for trade last year and nobody wanted him. Zero people have ever said that. Adam Shine is the only person that's ever said that. The trade for Jordan Love and Rodgers coming off the back-to-back MVPs because Jordan Love has no value. So. Listen, you saw the Chicago Bears tweeted out today a picture of a bear waving goodbye. Rodgers owned Chicago. There's a party right now going on in fan bases all across the NFC North, all across the NFC. The Green Bay Packers... Every- what, what does that add to the conversation? Of course they're excited that Aaron Rodgers is gone. He's been a living nightmare for them. And again, they're playing the same stupid game you are. 
basically saying, well, we know Jordan Love is garbage just because we feel like saying that we know that. Therefore, we're going to throw a party about it. But to pretend as though we're having some kind of an actual intelligent discussion is laughable. Every single year with Aaron Rodgers, the upside was to go to the Super Bowl mm -hmm. and win it. Brian Gunekis decided to trade and torpedo the relationship starting with that draft pick in 2020 with the best, most accomplished player in the history of the organization. Mark Murphy. <laughs> it's hilarious that he made this horrible decision to torpedo a relationship and then still got all of that production out of him anyways. <laughs> so he spit in the guy's face and then told him, get your stupid looking face back on the field and go in football games. And he said, yes, sir. And he went and did it until the day he decided to retire and he didn't want to play football anymore. Again, words out of his own mouth. He doesn't want to play the game anymore. He doesn't want to do it anymore. Not, I don't want to play for the Packers anymore. He doesn't want to play football anymore. And then we end up getting value out of a guy that wanted to retire by pissing him off again so that he goes to the Jets and then we screw the Jets over and get compensation that we shouldn't have got from them. You want me to be mad about that? We drafted a quarterback to replace a guy that was on the way out, that was disgruntled, that was not playing very well. That's part of the game. Calling that torpedoing a relationship is freaking childish. But I, I, I guess I appreciate you acknowledging that Aaron Rodgers is a bit childish, that he is not mature enough to be able to handle that. The basic reality that your job is not, which, by the way, Rodgers, he's the one that has said these words out of his mouth. As long as he plays well, his job is not in danger. And he said he wasn't scared. So, okay, there you go. He didn't choose to torpedo a relationship. He did the baseline minimum expectations of a GM. Well, he made Rodgers mad. I don't give a crap. Well, he ruined the relationship. I don't give a crap about the relationship. I don't need them to have a relationship. Rodgers doesn't even have a relationship with his own wide receivers. What do I care about his relationship with the GM? They don't need to even talk to each other. They have different jobs. One guy throws the ball. One guy goes and evaluates talent. That's it. They don't need to even know each other. Give a crap about their relationship? Has nothing to do with anything. He doesn't like that Brian Gutekunst drafted Jordan Love. Who cares? What does that have anything to do with Aaron Rodgers' decision to be a Green Bay Packer? Nothing. So Gutekunst did something stupid. That's his problem. That has nothing to do with you. You get to decide what fan base you want to play for, what stadium you want to play in, what locker room you want to be a part of, what head coach you want to play for. All these guys that are the Green Bay Packers, they're, they're all on you. And if Gutekunst wants to be a complete idiot and not draft the right people, that's his problem. But it hurt your feelings and that torpedoed the relationship? I don't care. You don't need a relationship with your GM. And, and despite what Rodgers has brainwashed some people to believe, there doesn't need to be cuddle sessions between the quarterback and the GM. They don't need to talk to each other. Unless it has something to do with anything that the GM would like from him to, to better do his job in terms of, you know, the locker room or any of that kind of stuff. Exit interviews, you know, like at the end of the year, hey, you know, this, that, or the, just to kind of help steer the ship slightly. Whatever. Minor stuff. They don't need a relationship. By the way, are they even the same age? Why is Roger so obsessed with a relationship with some old dude? I don't know. I guess I don't know how any of that works. But again, that, that whole thing is so stupid. And, and why is he doing that? Now, apparently, Adam Shine did this whole routine. A lot of people have pointed it out. He did the exact same thing when Brett Favre went away. He said the exact same thing. What a stupid organization. There must be just like a certain kind of wiring in certain people's brains where it's like when you've done really good things, you're just always that thing and nothing changes. It's like... There's a lot of information that goes into, for example, the Brett Favre trade. And just saying, well, look at what he's done for so long and look at all the great things he's done. That's the only variable you can see. That's a little insane. I don't know. Anyways, I'll leave you guys to it. I'm going to get going. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>